operative missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. Shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. Castro thought the Americans were about to attack, and he wanted Khrushchev to order those missiles fired and eliminate this scourge from the face of the earth. We'd all been lied to about it. Khrushchev had a back-channel uh, means of corresponding with Kennedy. He lied about what he was doing in Cuba. War was likely to come, and some of those hawks were saying, I told you so. That all of us sitting around that table could be uh, sitting there in our last day on Earth. The United States, as the world knows, will never start a war. Showtime. Welcome to the show. I'm Brent Holland and welcome one and all. Get the coffee going, get the tea going, get a beverage of choice going, get in your most comfy chair. We're going to be talking about the JFK assassination tonight with none other than Alan Dale. Yes, people and fans of this show will know that name. Alan, of course, is the executive director of the Assassination Archives and Research Center. I purposely didn't write a bio for Alan because we would spend the next 20 minutes, half hour, just going over all the things he's achieved in his life. Basically, what I want to get across for the novices in the JFK assassination, there's the shallow end of the pool, and then there's the deep end of the pool. This is the deep end. Put on your floaty because that's exactly where we're going to go. Welcome to the show, Alan. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you. Well, God bless you, brother. I'm happy to be with you. I appreciate the privilege. It, thank you. I mean, you, every time you come on, you always fire up the troops, if you will, and get them going. So that's exactly where I want to go. Okay, let's talk about your new book. Well, it, my new book from four years ago, <laughs> it's new to anyone who is not already acquainted, but it is something that is a proverbial labor of love, which is a concept that I know uh, is something to which you can relate. When you care about something and you it has value to you, uh, maybe if you get lucky and uh, some the right people participate in, in ways that are helpful, maybe you, you end up with something uh, for which you're grateful. And that is certainly the case for me in relation to this project, The Devil is in the Details, Alan Dale with Malcolm Blunt on the assassination of President Kennedy. Um, Let me stop you right there. I want to read this blurb before we go any further. Malcolm Blunt's encyclopedic knowledge of the inner working of the CIA during the era of the Cold War is unrivaled. He is the Rosetta Stone for coded intelligence agency cables. Alan Dale discusses discusses with Blunt offer an astonishing range of depth and details essential to anyone with an interest in understanding President Kennedy's murder and the hidden machinations of U.S. spy bureaucracies. This is by Robert F. Kennedy, Jr., so no other book has a blurb by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. of this magnitude. Alan, how did this come about? Because this is groundbreaking. I mean, who can well, claim that? Oh, yeah, know. my buddy Robert, you know, me and Bob. We, well, you know, we just go out and have a burger. and, and you know. uh, My friend, Bobby Jr., is uh, a person whom I admire. Uh, I respect. He's supremely educated he's dedicated his life publicly and privately to fighting the proverbial good fight he's been more than a political philosopher he has engaged in the courtrooms of uh, the united states and elsewhere um you know these battles succession of 40 years worth of engagement as uh, one of america's most highly 
uh, accomplished environmental attorneys. He uh, he started an organization called Riverkeeper Alliance and uh, and Water Waterkeeper Alliance. Um, he was working in the Hudson Bay issue, cleaning up, uh, contending with the poisoners and the polluters, and issues that are you know relevant to improving the quality of life for people who may not yet even be born. And uh, he's also done something that I think is um, unique, and that is as um, perhaps a most visible member, uh, certainly of his generation, of his extraordinary family, he has taken it upon himself to study the and to engage on the subjects that you must contend with which you must contend if you choose to take a hard look a realistic look at the circumstances by which his family's influence and their lives were disrupted by gunfire and that's something that is, I think, a very noble and a courageous uh, pursuit, especially for someone, you know, who could easily choose to turn his back on all kinds of important things and indulge, you know, other interests. But instead, uh, you know, within the last 10 years of his life at this point, he reached out to a number of people within the JFK research community and others to engage on the subject of what happened to his uncle first. And then I had a profound conversation with him, truly startling for me, where for the first time ever, I learned that he was also investigating his father's death, uh, which was a, a really kind of a, an interesting moment for me in more than one way, uh, because uh, I had been talking to him. He uh, he was on a path of discovery dealing with the kind of areas that are most difficult to convey superficially, that every aspect of what we're dealing with within the documentary record pertaining to Lee Oswald and aberrations in what's normal uh, within components of the CIA uh, for a period of four years between late 1959 and late 1963, and all kinds of stuff that it, you really have to slow down, you have to take your time, and you'd have to deal with it methodically to s bring somebody up to have a sense, any kind of sense, of what on earth are people like Dr. John Newman and Malcolm Blunt and uh, Bill Simpich and a handful of others, what on earth are we actually doing? And how, how, what on earth does it have to do with what happened at 1230 on, you know, November 22nd of 1963? So it's difficult, it's a challenging area to, to address. And he, he, approached a number of us. He initiated discussions with us, and then I ended up developing friendship with him. I love the guy. Um, and, uh, you know, whatever's going on right now in relation to his choices and the options and the way he is adapting to realities, for instance, in relation to the Democratic Party's determination to you know, uh, focus uh, um, state-of-the-art campaign of character assassination, misrepresentation, and deception pertaining to him and how he might contend with that and whatever is contemporary has nothing to do with these conversations that I've had with him over a period of years um, and uh, the moment at which I learned that he was also dealing with his father was a shocking moment for me in my life. Uh, it, it might be, I don't want to make it overly cinematic, but I, if I was just casually discussing it with you, as perhaps I am, 
I would tell you that I experienced something that was unique uh, to me, some or unprecedented, I should say. I think I started to black out while I was standing holding a telephone. And I, I remember the odd sensation of feeling like I, within my frame of vision, I felt like there was blackness coming from the, the periphery towards the center of my of what I was looking at. And it came because he called me, I was on a gig, I was playing a job and I'd just finished the first set and my phone rang and it was him and I ran out to a more secluded part of this venue. And uh, and he, I don't know what we talked about initially, but very early in that conversation, he said to me, what do you know about a guy named Thane Eugene Caesar? And that moment when he brought up that name, was so shocking to me. I'll never forget it because I, I, I mean, you, you and I've been real buddies for a long time. You hear me being speechless very much, very often. So I, I was stunned truly profoundly. Uh, and I didn't say anything. He said, Alan, are you there? And I said, yes. And that brought me back from that moment of, of real suspended animation for a moment where I, I could not believe what I had just heard. And, uh, and he said, uh, he's a suspect in my father's murder. And I said, I know. And whatever I said thereafter, you know, I probably talked about Dave, uh, Dan Moldea and, uh, Thane Eugene Caesar's participation in uh, polygraph examination and his move to the Philippines and stuff like that. But what I learned uh, thereafter was that Bobby was planning at the time on going to Soledad or wherever it is that uh, Sirhan Bishira Sirhan was incarcerated. And he intended, if you can imagine such a an extraordinary moment, he 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 was committed to going and speaking with Sirhan, which ultimately he did. So he's engaged in a personal thing. It's, you know, it has slightly Greek kind of echoes, you know, of kind of a, a hero's journey. Um, that's the way I perceive it. And it's not easy. So the answer is uh, I texted him I when the manuscript of this thing, I was keeping him apprised of what I was talking about and who I was speaking you know, who else I was talking to who were relevant to helping me complete this project of the great Malcolm Blunt, who's a brilliant researcher, a brilliant analyst, a person of consequence for decades behind the scenes in the JFK story, and the single most knowledgeable person I will ever know about the interior, the internal systems, the management authorities, every human being on the playing field during the Cold War of the competing uh, spy agencies. And that includes first and second chief directorates of the of Soviet intelligence and obviously MI6 and MI5 and French intelligence and CIA and FBI and all of that. He's the source of an awful lot of stuff that has ended up in the print, printed pages associated with other authors. And so somehow, because my life is very weird, uh, I had the good fortune, the blessing and the privilege of being allowed to put together a project um, which is built around 10 unscripted uh, transcripts of uh, private conversations with Malcolm, one of which includes my dear friend Jeff Morley, another in very lengthy chapter five includes Dr. John Newman. Uh, so having people of that uh, distinguished ilk who share common areas of expertise to, for me to be allowed to be in the room with them is an extraordinary privilege and opportunity. And uh, thanks to them, I was able to put this book together. I kept Bobby apprised of what was going on because I kept saying, you know, I'll, I'll be shocked if this comes together because for the first time and only time I was responsible for everything with the book, including the cover, which indescribably beautiful photograph uh, composite. Thank you for showing it. Uh, that was created by the most brilliant person I know, uh, truly breathtaking 
intellectually and artistically and perhaps otherwise uh, Darlene Hill Davis put that cover photo together for me of Malcolm at the National Archives and then a crude um, uh, background of uh, with we'll show residue. a proper picture of it so people can see it when you're talking. Well, I I, I was distracted briefly. <laughs> I do that sometimes. Um, I, it's it a happens. compilation of two separate photographs. It does. The older we get, it seems to happen more frequently. But God only knows. I, I got to stop you right there, though, because we we've gone far into it, and I've got to put context to some of the names you meant. You uh, you had mentioned. Um, first of all, Alan is a professional musician. He plays drums. He's uh, He's been the um, the roadie, if you will, for uh, Buddy Rich, Louis Belson, and a whole bunch. No, of them. I wouldn't put it like that. I wasn't a roadie. I lived with them and uh, was, <laughs> shared a bed I mean, with Louis. Louis. Louis was Louis was like my dad, and I slept in the same bed with him twice because we checked into a place and there was one big bed. That you'll be happy to know it wasn't a hot, but. On two separate occasions, we had one bed, and I just stood there, and he said, well, which side do you want? And I said, just keep your hands to yourself. Anyway. Uh, okay, I didn't want to go down. I just wanted to explain that. So when he said he was playing thing, a gig, that's what he was doing. Yeah, so, right, that's reasonable to point out. But I'm a sh career show drummer and band leader and jazz swinging jazz drummer, and, you know, I think that helps keep me, keep it. it is valuable because it, provides some um, kind of some balance counterbalance for you know a lot of the deep dark passages where there will never ultimately be I hate to make a lofty pronouncement I resist doing that there may never be light at the end of the tunnel but there certainly are additional tunnels and that's what we pursue we get to deeper places we ask different and better informed questions and that's how our uh, you know, that's how our progress is earned. And to finish my thought in response to your original question, wait, I gotta tell ago, people who Thane Eugene Caesar is, or you can let you me want. let me to okay. continue my thought. Um, I told Bobby that I had this manuscript, and that even though he was busy, this was in uh October of 2020. 19 or 2020 october 2020 i said uh, you know i i've already given you some flavor i've given him some expert excerpts and i said if you want to see the whole thing and you feel like you you know that would be beneficial let me know and i'll send it to you and he uh he to make a longer story less fatiguing ultimately he texted me and said if you need a blurb let me know and I just stood and looked at that for five minutes and laughed because it seemed funny to me because I didn't ask him. I would not have asked him. That would put him on the spot. And I thought it was awfully uh, generous and gracious of him. But he knows he knows us. You know, he, I got him in contact with both Dr. Newman and with Malcolm personally. And he knows who we are. He knows what we're engaged in. And so he, he has been... He, he, proactive in terms of engaging a number of serious people. I think um, I know he had communication with a number of people I'm not going to name. Um, and, and that's a crash course because we're all used to dealing with this stuff for years and years and years. But imagine coming to it, having whatever you bring and whatever he brings, um, you know, he has things that we don't have just in terms of his personal experience. You know, he offended J. Edgar Hoover when he was 10 years old. I can't say that, you know, so he's got a lot of cool stuff, you know, in his own bag. And if you have not dealt with his memoir called American Values, Lessons I Learned from My Family, I highly recommend that that is a, an enriching opportunity to learn more about who this guy really is as opposed to being told what to think about him. Uh, so that's available on Amazon. Uh, the question that was raised when I told you I learned for the first moment that we were not dealing exclusively with various versions of the Oswald figure over a period of about four years within the documentary record, that we were also going to deal with his father, that came as a really... Uh, um, 
a dramatic revelation to me. Uh, and the figure to whom he referred, Thane Eugene Caesar, was a minimum wage, you know, paid guard with a twenty-two caliber pistol on his, in his holster, uniform guard with a hat and a, and a clip-on tie who seems to have been standing in a very, very particular spot during the sequence of the shooting at the Ambassador Hotel on the early, early morning after midnight of uh, June 5th of 1968, uh, and was in a position to be among the people escorting Robert Kennedy through the kitchen pantry when Sirhan Sirhan makes an appearance also, very specific location within that confined space and empties an eight shot, also 22 caliber pistol. And so, a great deal of uh, interest has been focused on Thane Eugene Caesar. There's uh, iconic and profound photograph of Robert Kennedy prone on the floor with the uh, busboy, one. Uh, I can't think of his name. He's gone now, but he was a beautiful guy. Uh, and and uh, close to physic, close physical proximity to Robert Kennedy's right hand is a clip on tie on the floor. And that tie his name was to... Juan. Juan, what the hell was his last name? I can't remember. The photograph to which I refer includes Thane Eugene Caesar's clip on tie. And um, so he's a guy that that ultimately Bobby was you know, sufficiently interested in that through an intermediary, he made personal contact with Thane Eugene Caesar, who had been probably hounded to some extent, uh, you know, take, looked at certainly in a post-assassination world, uh, never demonstrated a, a any newfound wealth, or so far as I'm aware, as if, you know, he had been on an assignment for which he was compensated. But he did eventually move to the Philippines. And uh, Robert Kennedy Jr., it's a matter of public record. I'm not giving away anything that he hasn't already described. He had made arrangements. I'll put it like that. He had made arrangements and set it in motion to go down there, to go there, down, how silly, to go to the Philippines and meet personally with the man that probably Bobby thinks is the person responsible for his father's death. I know for certain that despite the fact that Sirhan Sirhan was convicted and sentenced to death, the death sentence was um, changed when the state of California decided not to exercise uh, capital punishment anymore in its judicial system. And, uh, and there's no question, as the late Paul Schrade would have been the first to point out that certainly Sirhan was intent upon doing as much harm as he possibly could, and he shot five other people. Uh, first shot may have hit Paul Schrade in the head, and uh, when, you know, he didn't wake up for several days, and then someone had the terrible responsibility of responding to, to that first question, what happened, and is Bobby okay? Um, so, so that's a, an episode that I had nothing to do with at all and would not have had anything to do with at all. Uh, but it did unfold in the way I've just described. And that was quite a moment for me because I was shocked to know that he was doing this most difficult thing. He was not just looking at his uncle. He was also looking at the circumstances of his father's murder. Where were you that night? Well, you know that. You know that. I was asleep upstairs. In the Ambassador Hotel. And your parents yeah. were downstairs. Correct. And during the last five weeks of my father's life, I he was completely lucid, and I had, they had never talked to me about the thing. The thing was a big deal in my family's life, in the life of my family. And... Uh, and I was an only child, and they, I was eight years old. I'd been in the room, in the ballroom uh, earlier in the day, and my parents were on different shifts driving elderly people to the polls so that they would vote for for Bobby, Robert Kennedy, instead of Eugene McCarthy. 
Um, but during the last five weeks, I brought up the subject because I knew my father was not going to survive indefinitely. And, uh, you know, it's not, I hope to God we're not just going to deal with things that are so sad and all of that. But the final moment where I brought up the subject for the last, really kind of for the only time that I can recall, maybe once uh, at the 10 year mark in 1978. Uh, where I know they were reminded of the thing that had been so devastating that they lived through 10 years earlier. But uh, during the last five weeks, I asked him something, I don't remember the wording, about what what he remembered of the day or the night and uh, the first thing he said was the only thing he said. And then I moved on. The first thing he said was, and I quote, I heard the shots coming from the kitchen pantry. And that was a drag, you know. That was a drag, that's for sure. Absolutely. Um, Alan, we're going to have to start to wrap up now. But I'm going to keep you around for a second show. It's just that I have to keep the shows within 30 minutes. We've been speaking with Alan Dale. We've been talking about the Bobby Kennedy assassination. It's a road that I hadn't intended on going down, but we did. And just to give you a brief overview about the Bobby Kennedy assassination, June 5th, 1968, he passed away June 6th, 1968. Thing Eugene Caesar was, as Alan said, was a security guard supposed to be protecting Bobby Kennedy. Now, but not affiliated with the entourage. He was kind of an on-site right. guy. Right. He's a suspect in Robert Kennedy's assassination, whether now, he's he, living or not. He's a suspect. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing, folks. Um, he's standing behind Bobby Kennedy. In front of Bobby Kennedy is Sirhan Sirhan. Bobby Kennedy's fatal bullet shot came from less than two inches behind his right ear at an upward angle. Right. Sirhan Sirhan was never behind Bobby Kennedy and was never able to be that close to make that fatal yeah, shot. That's so, probably correct that his shooting hand, the hand with the gun uh, that, you know, was captured by George Plimpton and Carl Eucher, who was the uh, Mater D, and uh, Bill, uh, what's his name? Um, can't think of his name, but and eventually Ro Rosie Greer comes in, mm -hmm. um, and uh, that shooting hand was, by all accounts with which I'm acquainted, the shooting hand was never within three feet at the closest, never fully extended arm, but the the gun hand was never closer than three feet, and may not even have been within that radius of you know the pr proximity of his target so you know yep and it's kind of thing's thing. gun was never taken by law enforcement for investigation to see if it had been fired that day by the way and um he said he had sold the gun off and they in arkansas and yeah. they tracked the person down who had the gun and the guy had thrown it in a river for convenience a lake sake. a lake yeah i'm sorry it was eventually recovered but that's a whole other thing okay so there it is in a nutshell. I'm Brent Holland from The Brent Holland Show. See you next time.